hosts of the, uh, the water conference, the Kingdom of the Netherlands and Tajikistan. Then we will have three panels covering themes three, four, five of the conference interactive dialogue. So water for climate resilience and environment, water for cooperation and the water action decade. So we have another full day ahead of us. And again, we uh, welcome the, your comments through the Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, invite, uh, uh, it's really my pleasure to recognize and invite Mr. Hank Ovi, Special Envoy for International Water Affairs, Affairs from the Kingdom of the Netherlands, for joining us today. Mr. Ovi, please, uh, we, uh, we, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Nayara, uh, and thanks for uh, uh, kicking us off uh, on this second webinar, uh, but it's not actually the second webinar. It is uh, one of many ways on how the two co-hosts, uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the Republic of Tajikistan, try to do outreach and engage uh, as, as much as possible and as many as possible from around the world, knowing that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, uh, organizing a UN conference every 46 years, we have to take massive opportunity for engaging and including as many voices uh, as we can from across. Uh, also on behalf of my colleague Sultan, who was here yesterday, I have the honor to kick you off in the context of what we want to achieve. Because, uh, and forgive me, but First, thank you and Dessa for, uh, and you and Water for being such an uh, amazing and strong secretariat. But at the same time, we know uh, conferences, also UN conferences by themselves don't change the world. Yeah? We need collective commitments and actions to make the change happen. And that is exactly why this conference on water, uh, after 46 years in March in New York, puts the spotlight on actions and commitments. Commitments that should be bold, transformative, that should come from everyone in every type of coalition, from every region and every place around the world. But at the same time, knowing that those commitments being bold and ambitious, we also see the risks of that. Individual commitments uh, by themselves can, you know, bring to, being brought together become like a postmodernistic flower garden. Yeah, uh, they bloom for a season and before you know it, so, so the co-host ambition yeah, of including all and seeking transformative cross-sectoral action-oriented commitments is that we bring those commitments together in a water action agenda. And that agenda helps to do a couple of things. One, to make them comprehensive so they actually can start to strengthen each other to ensure that the coalitions that bring forward bold commitments can see each other and seek each other collaborative opportunity. Second, to have it structured along the five themes of the interactive dialogues. And Sultan and the, and the webinar yesterday talked about the first two themes. Uh, we will uh, address the other three themes, what are for climate, resilience and the environment, looking at source to sea, biodiversity, climate, resiliency, and disaster risk reduction. Uh, water for cooperation, yeah, of critical importance, but also an asset when we talk about water, transboundary, international water cooperation, cross-sectoral, but also including scientific cooperation and water across the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And last but not least, the water action agenda as the theme to act accelerate the implementation of the objectives of the decade, including through the UN Secretary General's Action Plan, also the team to look across and beyond the conference at the multilateral, regional, national, and local systems, and how we up our game on how we're going to achieve these commitments. The Water Action Agenda is structured and organized around these themes and will be the supportive mechanism to drive actions towards implementation, to assess, validate, and evaluate so we can guide and steer the coalitions behind these actions, stop what's not working or steer, scale and replicate, which is the most important part where things are working and innovate where we need innovation. 
And that level of innovation is going to be of critical importance. So we call on the world, young and old, I would say more experienced than young, perhaps, from every sector and silo, from every region, every community, to come together in strong collaborative coalitions and get up with bold commitments, commitments that aim for the sky. There is so much to lose. Water is our most precious resource. It's forgotten, uh, it's undervalued and it's misunderstood. And we abuse it at a rate unprecedented. Right now, our freshwater resources in our ground, our bank, you could say, for sustainable development is, re is the thing we rob and pollute. We lose fresh water, we pollute it, and it's becoming more saline. This is the dark picture of fresh water. And the connection to green water, because this is about blue water in our grounds and our rivers and lakes. But if we think about green water, the amount that we put out in the sky that actually helps increase the impact of climate change. Uh, and therefore is preventing ourselves towards climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, it's also uh, uh, unseen. Looking at these challenges, commitments that are about science and data and understanding, that are about valuing and evaluating and validating and coming up with new business cases and opportunities to invest in, and are about management, being with cooperation, informal and formal in communities with indigenous, as well as driving actions across, are going to be of critical importance. We have to tap into the knowledge of the world from the indigenous and the communities, the women and children and across to the business leaders, the private sector, the investors and the governments at every scale. Only by coming together and working together can we aim for this high ambition to change the world by investing in water. And we can, because if we invest in water, it trickles down across the whole 2030 agenda. But if we don't, we undermine achieving all of these goals. So I look forward to this webinar where we will discuss the last three themes, hear your ideas, but also make sure, get your act together, public and private, individual and collective, and come forward with those commitments that are go beyond ideas that can be implemented, but that also aim for the sky, because they have to be ambitious. Otherwise, we lost our best opportunity of this conference. So we count on you. But you also count on us. The conference is only the beginning of the implementation and scaling. We won't go away. We're committed to see this through way on beyond 2030, because that is the commitment the two governments give you in the context of this water action agenda and what the UN system will provide you. So come to New York, bring your commitments, work together, and we look forward to help support scale and replicate them to get this rippling effect coming out of the conference. Thank you, Nayara. Thank you so very much to the special envoy, uh, Ovin, for joining us today. I know you were very, very busy uh, also in Davos, pushing the agenda further and mobilizing towards the uh, water conference. And we are also very grateful for all your support and push and energy to make this conference as inclusive as possible. So thank you very much again. Colleagues, we shall now start with our panels. So we, uh, the first panel of today will address the theme of the third interactive dialogue to be held during the conference, Water for Climate, Resilience and Environment, Source to Sea, Biodiversity, Climate Resilience and uh, DRR. So covering SDGs 6.5, 6.6, 7, 11.5, 13, 14 and 15. We uh, again ask participants to add the questions to the Q&A box. And please, if you are uh, uh, want this question to be addressed by one of the panelists, uh, please flag that uh, when you do so. Let me now invite Ms. Liz Bernhardt. She is deputy head of the Freshwater Unit of UNEF. And uh, we are really, really grateful for her accepting to moderate this panel. So Liz, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naira. And thank you, Hank, for those inspiring, inclusive, and also challenging words to us on the task that we have ahead of us for the water action agenda. 
Hi to everyone online. It's a pleasure to see so many people joining us from all over the world for this exciting conversation and exchange of ideas on climate resilience and the environment. And my name is Liz from the Freshwater Unit at the UN Environment Program's headquarters in beautiful Nairobi, Kenya. On behalf of those uh, three organizations that have been tasked through UN Water to support the technical coordination of this theme, that's the World Meteorological Organization, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and UNEP, it's really a pleasure to join you today to moderate this multi-stakeholder thematic webinar. We really look forward to hearing all of your views today, and I know we've got some great speakers lined up with about 40 minutes of time, so I'm going to jump right into our introductions and discussion. We'll be asking our panelists a few questions to get us started off, and then I'll open up for questions from our participants through the chat online before we wrap up this session. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists for the next part of the session. Uh, if I can just make sure that all panelists have your videos and your mics on. Uh, we will be joined by Ms. Judith Kaspersma, Department Head for Flood Risk at Deltaris. We also have with us Mr. John Matthews, Executive Director of AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. Also joining us is Ms. Catherine Farr, Senior Policy Advisor for International Climate Action at WaterAid. And rounding out our panel is Mr. James Dalton, Director of the Global Water Program at IUCN. To get us started off, we've got three questions to begin with and about five or six minutes of speaking time for each panelist. So I'm going to drop those questions into the chat for you. Hope everyone can see that. And the first question we are going to have is, what fundamental changes do you consider necessary for accelerating progress to achieve SDG 6? The second one will be, how can we best leverage the UN 2023 Water Conference and in particular, the Water Action Agenda to enable action? And finally, to put you on the spot, what commitment do you have for the Water Action Agenda? Judith, I'll start with you, and I know you've got some PowerPoint slides, so hopefully we can get those up on the screen and over to you. Thank you very much. I'll just wait for the PowerPoint to appear. There's always technical difficulties this time. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure the first one. <laughs> uh, I wonder if uh, perhaps uh, Liz, we could perhaps start with the second panelist uh, with apologies to you, Judith, and we'll um, be sorting the slides. No problem with me. If it's okay no. with John Matthews, <laughs> uh, then John, happy to... I'll hand over to you. <laughs> no worries. Great. Over to you, John. Uh, all right. Th thank you so much. Um, um, uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Your Excellencies, uh, to my fellow panelists and to my colleagues listening today uh, uh, globally. Um, I'm grateful to represent the 2,400 members of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, or AGWA. Uh, I'm the Executive Director uh, for AGWA. As a brief element of context, AGWA is a network of individuals and organizations uh, that works in both the technical and policy spheres on uh, climate and water. In both cases, AGWA crowdsources the best practices, recommendations, frameworks, analytical procedures, and policy recommendations to ensure that our water resources can become climate resilient. Our success comes from the success of our members. One of the core beliefs at our founding in 2010 was that water was the medium of most negative climate impacts. What we've come to believe from a decade of intense collaboration uh, 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 both North and South, is that water is also the medium for most of our climate resilience. While I am an ecologist by training and much of this theme focuses on biodiversity and ecosystems, I'd like to focus my points on climate resilience as an entry point. Two basic challenges for addressing climate change exist relative to the SDGs. First, even if we stopped all carbon emissions today, the climate would continue to evolve for at least many decades. We cannot go back to the climate of my 13-year-old son's birth, much less my birth 50 years ago. Any specific uh, impact target for 2030 will have a limited shelf life. 
Second, our abilities to estimate with confidence about how future climate will evolve, especially with regard to the water cycle, are very limited. I believe this forces us to consider how to address the prospect of climatic transformation, which is when a region develops fundamentally new climatic, hydrological, and ecological characteristics. Globally, we see this transformation already well underway in high latitude and high altitude regions, such as when we lose a glacier and we see a grassland or even forest emerge. But within a decade or two, I predict most regions of the planet will be well along the path of transformation. My read in the scientific literature is that the Brazilian Amazon began the process of transformation around 2010 as the region driven by both deforestation and rainfall shifts began to move from a tropical wet forest to a tropical dry savanna or sahado. This year, the journalism of the Amazon has begun to catch up with science. I believe we can expect comparable levels of, of transformation everywhere in our lifetime. I do not see the issue of transformation addressed in the SDGs. Of, for the March UN Water Conference, I expect to hear a lot about how to de-risk, that is, how to remove the effects of the most obvious climate impacts. For the ecosystems and communities and infrastructure that will endure for decades, centuries, even millennia, de-risking is at best a partial short-term solution. It's easy to say we need to fight climate change. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I hear it as a statement of grief as much as anything else. At this point, fighting climate change feels about as useful as fighting continental drift or the movement of planets around the sun. I've said many times that if climate change were a disease, it would be more like diabetes than cancer, a problem we must learn to manage rather than to eliminate. While we must clearly accelerate and complete our energy revolution, what we must also do is learn to live with the expectation of ongoing change, to get ready, to prepare, to ensure that we find ways to thrive and build prosperity in spite of change. Water resilience is different than de-risking and water resilience has become the primary focus of Agua over the past few years. The situation is serious, but we also have reason for hope. The concept of water resilience remains relatively new, but many institutions are now working in this space, uh, uh, even if the most important audiences are not necessarily water people. How do we reach those new audiences? My biggest hope is that the UN Water Conference in March can help water resilience permeate both more deeply and more broadly. Water resilience is the concept that we must act robustly and decisively for the impacts we can see with confidence, while we also plan for flexibility for the impacts we are less sure about or that we cannot predict with confidence. Water resilience does not assume that the past predicts the future. This approach uh, applies for infrastructure as much as regulatory frameworks, uh, protected areas and global governance. Water resilience should be the key that can lock in many of the SDG targets to ensure that they remain relevant beyond 2030. Agua has a number of water action agenda items to contribute for water resilience. First, the need for increasing capacity and training around water resilience is critical, especially for regions where transformation is already well advanced. Much of the capacity work uh, here targets innovation uh, in resilience. Uh, for instance, in 2018, culminating uh, about seven or eight years of collaboration within and beyond the Agua network, UNESCO published the Climate Risk-Informed Decision Analysis, or CRIDA approach. This is a, a methodology that's tolerant of limited data, that uses simple software, uh, and that helps technical decision makers engage with stakeholders to develop shared resilient solutions. It's been used in at least 30 countries to date. And UNESCO training programs have reached thousands of students globally, often in their native languages. We began with English, but we quickly expanded to Spanish, French, and Arabic through online courses and written materials. Uh, we will include Chinese and Russian next year. Designed for the developing world, it has also been adopted by the state of California in the US and approved for internal use by the World Bank. It is a global tool. Interestingly, in, uh, 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 in the majority of applications, nature-based solutions appear as a critical uh, a very well-received component of water resilience and shared resilience planning. At a quite different level, in 2018, uh, Agua began collaborating with the UNFCCC to train national climate adaptation focal points in the basics of water-centric adaptation resilience, about four years before the IPCC began to call for uh, water-centric adaptation. Now called the CAST Adaptation Academy, we partner with three regional universities for three weeks of intense in-person uh, training our focal points. This work has already reached about 75 countries. We've also been developing quite specific guidance approaches. 
launching last August uh, with groups such as the Pacific Institute, uh, EMI, uh, and the World Resources Institute, we have co-developed an approach called the Water Resilience Assessment Framework, or RAF. RAF is intended to accelerate uh, our corporations and utilities into the water resilience space. RAF is very bold and, and quite innovative and should have a promising and long lifespan. Second, Agua has come to believe that if water is the medium of resilience, water must also rise above being a sector and become a connector across sectors. Resilience is a shared property and, and developing a level of systems awareness and thinking is central to effective resilience. Here through a program called the Water Tracker for National Climate Planning, we've been working for two years with about two dozen national governments to help them see water and climate risk and synergies across and within ministries. The Water Tracker is a demand-driven process and serves as one of the most effective ways that countries can ensure coherent and effective NDCs and NAPs from an adaptation perspective. Likewise, in March at the UN Water Conference, we will launch a publication aimed at macroeconomists, finance ministries, and central bankers. We've long managed our national economies for efficiency, for stability, but these concepts are profoundly threatened by climate change Traditional economic thinking could actually make our economies more vulnerable to climate risk. Resilience is a new economic concept and our goal is to provide the evidence and guidance to show how water is at the center of economic resilience. This work is in cooperation with a diverse array of entities, including the governments of the Netherlands, Spain, Germany, and the UK, along with the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, the global utility uh, Veolia has joined our initiative this week. Our partnership also includes NGO groups such as Agua, um, um, my uh, fellow panelist uh, uh, from Deltatus, and Wetlands International, among many others at this stage. I'd like to end by saying that the fear of climate impacts, especially for water, tempts us to focus on protecting ourselves, to build ever higher walls for defense, to isolate ourselves. In my experience, this is at best short-term resilience, what I call castle resilience. I think we're stronger by linking systems of, of water through health, energy ecosystems, transport, agriculture, and cities, by tearing down the walls between institutions and within communities, by seeing resilience as a shared emergent quality, uh, we're all more resilient, especially for the challenge of transformation. It's making my chickens uh, very uh, 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 excited at this point. Uh, you can hear them just outside the window. Um, uh, our youth and young professionals, uh, in addition to the chickens, uh, see that our traditional solutions do not match the issues that climate change presents. Agua is trying to rise to these challenges through the action agenda. No one of us is smart enough, rich enough, or powerful enough to adapt in isolation. Indeed, uh, becoming resilient together is in the true spirit of the SDGs and the UN Water Conference itself. Thank you. Thank you so much for those very inspirational words. They're always very close to, to my own heart. And you brought up some uh, excellent points in your intervention just now. Um, the idea of having to adjust uh, to climatic transformation um, on how the past that we've seen probably won't or cannot predict the future. Um, also on, on de-risking. And I love your analysis of climate change being uh, like more like diabetes than cancer. Um, more than anything, I think the idea of water resilience is a rallying cry for us all, that water doesn't always have to be seen as the victim, but rather is a, a very important part of the solution. Um, and the commitments that you've suggested and that you've brought forward, such as CRIDA and uh, the Water Resilience Assessment Framework, are extremely exciting. And I can see that you'll be contributing, um, making great strides towards capacity development, training, and twinning as well as innovation around resilience. Thank you so much for that, John. And I'm sure we'll come back to you um, with questions from our, our, um, our audience later on in this session. I'm going to try to jump back now <laughs> to Judith and see if the PowerPoint uh, gods may be working in our favor now and whether the slides are able to be shown up on the screen. So let's give it a try. Thanks, uh, Liz. I actually decided that I can do it without, without a PowerPoint. So, uh... No worries about that. Um, I just realized that my charger, is, uh, my charger is not in, and I have to do that. One second. This is resilience and adaptation at its finest. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I'm all set. 
Thank you very much, uh, Liz, for giving me the floor. Um, my name is uh, Judith Kaspersma. I'm a department head at a Dutch uh, academic institute called Deltares. Uh, I'm working in flood risk management, and I'm very delighted to be here today and honored that I can also uh, say some words. Um, we were asked to answer these uh, three questions and give our opinion uh, also on the water action agenda and the commitment. So uh, I'll try to, uh, to do that to the best of my knowledge. Um, and uh, well, in terms of these fundamental changes that are necessary for accelerating the progress, I do see a lot of similarities also with the, the words of my colleague, uh, John Matthews. Uh, I really want to advocate uh, that we maximize our efforts uh, uh, to accelerate this progress. Um, to collaborate even more than we already do at all levels and with all partners. Uh, we really need to get out of our water bubble because actually our bubble is not that big. I mean, we work in it every day. So we think that this is our life, but there are lots of people outside our water bubble who that we desperately need to reach. So I want to really uh, call out to you to build coalitions with uh, within countries and between countries and and, and include the people outside our water bubble um, and not only look at our own interests, but at the mutual interests of, of uh, multiple groups and work on integrated programs um, and work on coordination uh, in countries beforehand, not only with the water sector, with, but from a broader systematic approach, uh, asking help from other sectors like health, like finance, um, you name it. Um, we have often mutual interests and mutual ambitions and let's map these common interests and approach our challenges together. Um, then about the water uh, action agenda, I'm really enthusiastic about uh, the building blocks of the water action agenda. Um, and these building blocks are commitment to action, um, sustain and scale up the implementation uh, and follow up and uh, review your processes. Um, I think on the first one, commitment to action, this is really the way to go. We need to form alliances uh, that may be out of the box and that help us venture into unclaimed uh, territory. Um, and then about these commitments, um, I read in the Water Action Agenda concept notes that, that there are three types of commitments, foundational commitments, institutional commitments, and really the big game changers. Um, the first ones, uh, they may be small in size and, and reach, but they, they may still be very meaningful, I think. Um, you can think of commitments for schools, for local communities, etc., at the grassroots level. And I really want to, to call out to this crowd here, don't think your commitment is too small or too modest, but, but really try to bring it further and, and take it to New York. And also, if you can't get to New York, you can still file your commitment and combine it with, with commitments of other people. And I think this is really very important. Um, then the second type of commitment, uh, and I want to give an example uh, about that uh, later, the institutional commitments, those are a bit larger in size. These are um, partnerships between governments, civil society, academia, um, these groups and different sectors together to create large scale impact. Um, and then the third one, the biggest one, and uh, I think we can expect only a few of those because these are really about systemic change. Those are the game changers. Uh, and these are based, based, I think, on a deep knowledge of systems change and how we can make a transition to a new, uh, to a new path. Um, and about um, then this was commitment to action. And then the second part of the water action agenda was uh, sustain and scale up implementation. Something I want to mention about that. Um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is capacity development. And I really want to stress that if we want to take implementation serious, we should also work on this implementation capacity because I see in various projects that it's often lacking that people, I mean, we can come up with really nice plans and policies, but how to actually implement it and how to do it and also, uh, uh, capacity for adaptive approaches. Like uh, John also already mentioned, I think Aqua is working on a really nice um, program called the Adaptation Academy. That's where you actually 
um, gain the knowledge and you, you get the capacity to actually work on adaptation. And I think that's a really nice example of that capacity. Um, let me think. Uh, yeah, then I would like to give an example of an institutional commitment that we are currently working on and that we want to present in a side event during the conference. Um, under the umbrella of the Water and Climate Coalition, which is uh, established by the WMO, we are working on a program called Action on the Ground. And this is a program to better understand uh, water availability and, and uh, water risks. And it is very much coming from the idea of um, what kind of data needs do we have, uh, data needs in the field of hydrology to better assess the water availability and water risks. Um, well, th this is an endeavor that we do with multiple partners in a, in a pilot right now. We do this with uh, three government, government institutions from three different countries. We work with the local private sector. We work with local NGOs, with international NGOs and organizations like, for example, um, Agua and also with WaterAid, of, uh, um, of which uh, uh, Catherine is also here today with us. Um, and we work with uh, investment partners from uh, the private sector. Uh, so I think this is a really nice set of uh, partners with uh, whom we can reach uh, quite a lot of uh, challenges. Um, and uh, we want, to, well, if, if I follow the lines of the water and action agenda, I think we want to commit to action with this uh, uh, program called Action on the Ground. We want to sustain and scale it up to other countries later on, after we've done uh, our pilot in, in two countries. Uh, and then we want to follow up and use our long-term relations to review the ongoing process for this uh, commitment. Um, and I'm really keen to uh, present this commitment uh, at the conference in a side event together with our uh, partners. And I'm really looking forward to see you all over there. So this is uh, what I would like to share also as an example of uh, what an institutional commitment can look like. And I really hope that you will all come up with uh, commitments, uh, large and small, so that we can make this conference a success and come to tangible action. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. And I, I really like that. I think I could summarize some of your main points in three big eyes. And the first I word I noted down was integration. So you're really encouraging us to get out of the water bubble, pop that water bubble and look for integrated and coordinated approaches um, with other sectors. And that's incredibly important. Uh, the second I that, I, that, I, that struck me was implementation. You, we want to move and we need to move from commitment to action and we need to follow up and review on those commitments that we've made. And that takes capacity in order to do that. And the third thing I noted was institutions. And that's because you talked about an example of an institutional um, commitment or an institutional almost game changer and how to take that further. And, and you talked about uh, the, the new data portal that you're working on that will bring together information with water availability and risks and data needs. Um, and that's uh, very, very welcome. And we look forward, I'm sure, to that, um, finding out more about that in March at the conference itself. Thank you so thank much you for your interview. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and I think you might have to leave us soon. Uh, so um, if we don't get another chance to speak with you, um, thank you. Hopefully you can stay on as long as possible. You're welcome. Uh, we're now going to um, go over to our third panelist of today, and that's Catherine Farr. And Catherine, I will be asking you the same three questions. So over to you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'm really excited about this particular interactive dialogue because it really shows how much the SDGs interconnect and how we have to work together. I'll do my best to not reiterate um, the comments of John and Judith, uh, which uh, are, are really key to um, making the fundamental changes necessary. Um, but when we look at meeting a single SDG, let's say number six for water and sanitation, um, that directly impacts the goals 15 and 14 on like below and, uh, water and above land. It can't be achieved without considering climate impacts. That's SDG 13. So for example, without treatment of wastewater, Freshwater ecosystems can't flourish and the pollution they encounter often ends up in the oceans. And we know that currently 
of wastewater globally is returned to nature untreated. And that's not sustainable, um, even without climate change. And then you add the stresses of climate change onto that. And as John says, we need to think of new innovative ways to be resilient. Um, and we've, we've talked a lot about collaboration and integration, but we're not yet really seeing a widespread adoption of this holistic approach of working on water security, water and sanitation, and climate all together. Um, we're still seeing the institutional fragmentation, um, climate planning and investment that doesn't fully account for all water users. And um, to Judith and John's point, the low capacity um, that, that doesn't really allow um, for this integrated approach. And that comes across in lack of budgets and lack of human resources, lack of skills and lots of different capacities that need to be addressed on that. Um, so really to sustain and accelerate progress for the SDGs, we need these multi-sector holistic solutions. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the water action agenda and all of the commitments made out of that because I think this is really such a good opportunity as Hank said earlier to bring people together to bring together the different aspects of the water sector but also for us to galvanize energy to other sectors and really work towards this climate resilient multi-sectoral solution to help us reach the SDG targets in time and this is really an opportunity to remind ourselves that we can articulate those commitments for real progress. And I think it's very encouraging that the conference organizers will analyze the results of all of the commitments in time to report on them for July's high level political forum on sustainable development. So you can see that the conference itself is not just galvanizing energy, we're also fitting into the broader SDG space. And I think that's very important, especially when we try to bring people like the water sector in um, as we go to March. Over the last three years, WaterAids um, continued our focus on building climate resilience and adaptation, and we never do that alone. Uh, we partner with local grassroots organizations, work closely with national governments in Africa and South Asia and the Pacific, connect with donors and the private sector to understand how to remove the barriers that are reducing communities' capacity to respond to climate change and that are damaging freshwater ecosystems. Uh, we have highlighted climate as one of the four aims in our new decade-long global strategy, and that strategy is about partnerships with all the different stakeholders and donors to create sustainable solutions for WASH, which is water sanitation and hygiene. And like many of the organizations that are committed to the conference, we're talking with partners about how to interlink linkages with themes and what might be possible. And so it's really exciting for us to be asked to speak on climate resilience and environment today um, because it really underscores the connection between water resources and water and sanitation and hygiene. And as part of our work, um, we we're working on a policy paper linked to our new global strategy with recommendations on what can be done to achieve SDG linking to other areas. And um, as we all think, right, the whole purpose of this webinar is to get us excited and really thinking about what commitments we can make. I know lots of organizations haven't set everything out yet. If you haven't checked it out already, the Water Action Agenda website has some really good inspirational commitments. And there's one that I wanted to highlight because water aid supports and water poverty and we're a member of the Climate Action Network. And these are two of many organizations, including research institutions, government agencies, and development partners like JICA and GIZ, um, that have submitted a commitment called Water Justice Towards Sustainable Development. And this is focused on raising optimized funding needed to achieve SD6, SDG 6 in Bangladesh with a view that water justice can, has to take into account integrated water resource management and climate change. So really getting the funding, thinking about the funding, thinking about the types of interventions, thinking about how it all works together. Um, so hopefully that's an inspiring uh, commitment for others to think about um, as they leave the webinar today and prepare for March. Thanks so much. Sorry, are, did you cut out or are you finished? <laughs> oh no, sorry Liz, it's back to you. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't want to jump in uh, too early. Um, thank you so much for the inspirational message and information about the work that WaterAid's doing. And it's very inspiring to see those links between the traditional WASH agenda and water resources and ecosystems. 
And you also made very important mention of other SDGs uh, like 15 and 14, uh, and of course 13, and, and the, the, uh, the inextricable link between those ecosystems and a kind of source to see approach. Um, you made a very good point as well about different kinds of capacities that need to be addressed and developed um, in terms also of, of HR capacity, human resources, skills, and of course funding. Um, and I really like that you that you uh, raised the the um, the call to look at the water action agenda at the commitments that are already there and feel inspired to link up to each other to to join forces with you and others that are working in this space um, and to look beyond what will happen after this conference towards other major milestones for global commitments. Um, and so I really, really I appreciate and welcome. Um, you, you putting this into that very important bigger context. So thank you so much for your inputs and I'm sure that uh, there will be questions in our chat um, directed towards you after our, our, our fourth and last intervention from our panel. Thank you again. Finally, last but certainly not least, I'd like to hand over to James Dalton. Uh, James, over to you for your response on, on the same three questions, thanks. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, and I'll, I'll also be quite rapid because I realise that we're eating into some time here. Um, so I'm the head of water and land management at IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And so we are an organisation that is a union of state and non-state actors, around 1500 members. So it represents that um, hybrid link between what the government is trying to do and what civil society is trying to do and how those two things work or sometimes do not work as well as they potentially could. I think this conference provides the, the, the absolutely unique opportunity to, from my perspective, to recognize the global baseline of life on Earth in many ways, and that is water ecosystems and biodiversity. We are eroding our life support system, um, the very ecosystems that provide us with food security and which also provide us with drinking water and the resources which fundamentally drive our economies and generate our electricity. And we're doing it um, far too quickly in terms of how we're eroding the ecosystem and the functioning of the climate around that. So I think for me, the conference is the fantastic opportunity to push for greater and faster collaboration across science and to push for greater and faster collaboration into action. And this has probably been one of the greatest limitations that we've had in the water world. We know what we need to do technically. Sure, there's some new things that are on the agenda, but we're pretty good at figuring things out nowadays. But what we don't do is accelerate the action and get more of the good things done in the timeline that delivers the actions we want. And I think we can see that across many global conventions and many of the SDGs. We have great ambition. We just struggle to get momentum and action happening. And I think there's a few things we can do to improve on that front. Firstly, we need to stop looking at um, blaming the lack of political will. Political will is there, that's why the conference is happening and, and the, the words of, of Henk and the support from the government of the Netherlands and Tajikistan are vital in this sense to put water on the global stage. But it's political awareness, which is what's perhaps missing, is being able to put the right information in front of decision makers so they can understand the implications of poor investment and poor action on the trade-offs that certain decisions can make on our freshwater ecosystems and the impacts that it has on biodiversity and on climate change. This is critical in terms of how we can solve water challenges going forward. So better communication, better advocacy in front of decision makers, working with them as partners rather than working with them as purely principles. And I think that moves to my next point, which is very much about the need to fiercely collaborate. We can't no longer view each other as just simple partners working on projects. We have to have much stronger collaboration pathways so that everybody can achieve their aims, but there is a broader framework. The sum of the parts needs to be far greater than the whole to be able to achieve what we have to achieve uh, for uh, the SDGs, but also much more broader than that beyond 2030 as well. So we need to have that stronger cooperation and we need to have much broader diverse partnerships, something that I think Henk, Henk mentioned at the beginning. That also means that as individuals, as networks, as institutions, we have to be and a willingness and an openness to accept challenge and to accept change. 
we need to accept that maybe what we're doing isn't working fast enough, isn't working well enough. How can we learn from others? How can we learn from other areas of the economy that have moved much faster perhaps over the last few years because the demand on them, take for example, solar energy and solar power, how can we learn from what they've done to scale up and, and bring that experience into the water world? So I think there needs to be a level of objectivity in terms of what we're doing. Is this the right thing and are we doing it for the right reasons? And I say that because from an IUCN and a more biodiversity proposed um, focus, there are some really simple things to look at. And if you look at these problems from 40,000 feet, which is what I hope the conference is going to be doing as well as getting down into the nitty gritty. But if you look at some of these big issues, we need water to grow our food. But also at the same time, agriculture is responsible, is the world's largest consumer of water resources. It has been for 40 years. Nothing's changing that needle. Despite all the new technology, despite all the new approaches, nothing is moving that needle. So we're clearly not doing something right. And that needs to be opened up and investigated. Why is agriculture not improving in efficiency? What can be done on those fronts? Where will agriculture need to be in the future given climate change? And how can we make that work better with the water resources that are available? But at the same time, the greatest loss of biodiversity is as a consequence of agriculture. And yet there's far little being done on freshwater biodiversity to try and solve that problem. Uh, a, a billion people are reliant on freshwater fish, for example, for their protein intake. And yet this is a topic falls between the gaps. It's sort of sort of included in SDG 14, but it falls between the gaps of the SDGs, really. And there isn't enough attention on some of these critical elements. So not only linked to that, but one of the reasons that we don't deal with that is it tackles that tricky issue of pollution, which is something that generally from a freshwater world, we do not pay enough attention to. And this is critical. If we solve pollution problems, we will solve many production problems, but we'll also solve a lot of human health problems as well. Um, these things are really important because the solutions sit within different sectors. They sit within different parts of the water community of practice, but they also sit within different sectors and different stakeholders and at different scales. And they're often funded by different donors and investors. So we don't know enough yet as water people as to how to solve many of the problems that we are ultimately trying to solve. So I think the collaboration side needs to come across not just in terms of solving problems, but also sharing the science and sharing the conversations. And I think avoiding policing um, tactics and approaches, just because it's not following the standard practice or the standard manual, doesn't mean to say that the activities are wrong. We have to trial and error and be much more innovative um, and exhaust all of the possibilities to try and solve the problems we've got. And I think linked to that also is what new business models might be available to try and solve um, water challenges. And I don't mean that in terms of a sort of return on investment, but I do mean that in terms of what are the right operational practices, which organizations work well on solving problems together and what does it look like and how can we take that as guidance and share that across different stakeholder groups. One of the things that happened in 1977 at the conference was that there wasn't, in, in the last water conference when I was four years old, was that there was no real monitoring of progress. And I think what's critical out of this as commitments is how do they get structured in a way that is actions, that is frameworks, that's tools, that's strategy, and what do they look like? And how can they also be grown beyond 2030? So that we're also well aware of the fact that whilst the agenda to achieve for 2030 is going to be tough, we are still going to be solving problems that we've created in 2031. And I think this kicks off a really positive structure and sense of direction to reframe water challenges going forward and how we solve those. From our side, we'll be promoting and supporting a, a freshwater challenge. And we'll also be pushing our Nature 2030 program, which includes freshwater for the first time in our union as a key topic for our members to focus on. Um, I think I'll stop there because I think there's a lot of things still to further to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, and I, I also very much appreciate the comments and in inputs you've given. Some of them, I think, quite new and unique and others very closely linked in a beautiful way to what some of the other panelists have said. But you started by talking about how water is our global baseline of all life on earth uh, and essential for everything that we do. And yet it's critically undervalued and, and exploited. Um, 
I'm very glad that you mentioned pollution. If you hadn't done so, I would have done so. <laughs> we talk a lot about scarcity and, and water quantity issues, but pollution affects the availability of the water that we do have. Um, I love that you that you mentioned we should stop blaming a lack of political will and talk more about political awareness and our role in communicating in a clearer way. Um, I really liked what you said about our need for ob objectivity, and I would say you're even talking about humility. We should be able to mention um, and admit when things aren't working and when we need to do things differently. Um, and you also mentioned um, that solutions often sit within different sectors, and there's a need to share that information between sectors, between, uh, between countries, maybe between developing and developed countries, um, so that we can learn from each other in both directions. And that, that connects very well with what some of the other speakers have said. And we're very excited to hear, of course, about the commitments that IUCN is making and you personally. Um, I unfortunately have been informed that we are running a little bit over time. And so it does not look like we'll be able to open up for questions right now from the comments um, that we've received. But I would like to uh, invite and welcome everyone to please do stay engaged with this process through the website of the conference, through the forums that we have to gather inputs. Um, we very much look forward to hearing from you. And uh, please, let's keep the conversation going. Um, we really uh, look forward to the momentum that we're building up and, and we'll see in March and beyond. Uh, so with that, I am going to hand back over to Nayara um, and our next theme of water cooperation and say thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you thank so you. very, thank you so very much, uh, Liz, for moderating this session, and uh, to all the panelists for joining. We're really sorry for uh, the the timing of an uh, issue uh, today, but it's great that we are talking with the water community, which is uh, used to being flexible and adjusting as we move. So. I count on the support of the moderators and panelists of the next panel. We can stay a little longer if, if needed, but I know colleagues also booked the time for uh, until 11 a.m. Uh, New York time. So, um, so yeah, if please uh, moderators and speakers could support, for, so we adjust a little bit of time so we can have some time for uh, to address some of the comments and questions coming from the audience. So let's move to the next panel, which will be addressing water for cooperation, transboundary and international water cooperation, cross-sectoral cooperation, including scientific cooperation, and water across the 2030 agenda. So uh, we we and then we cover SDG 6.5, 6D, and SDG 16 and 17. Let me now uh, I have really a great pleasure to invite Mr. In Malik from a new. She will be moderating this panel. Thank you so very much, Ms. Malik, and it's great to have you again at this webinar. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nayara. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to uh, all of you. My name is uh, Serene Malik. I'm from Kenya, the Executive Secretary for the African Civil Society Network on Water and Sanitation and the Vice Chair for the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership. It is really my pleasure to be uh, this panel and um, we will be hearing from uh, Ms. Tanya Martinez, who's the representative of the Indigenous Informal Reference Group on Indigenous Peoples and Water Issues. Uh, Councillor Nikki Wenam, Executive Mayor of uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda District Municipality, Northwest Province, South Africa. Mr. Nicholas Vertemer, I apologize if I mispronounce that, co-founder and CEO of Water Plan. Mr. Christian Nielsen, Global Division Director, Climate Adaptation Humboldt. And uh, Ms. Shomi Hassan Chaudhary, uh, Awareness 360 founder, WASH activist. So um, water for cooperation, I know we tend to say that, yes, water unites. And we know to achieve it, SDGs, the, the, the various SGDs, SDGs, it should be inclusive, cross-sectoral, and action-oriented. And that there's actually a cost to non-cooperation. And uh, to quote uh, John Matthews, actually, that often says, that against climate change, we know that that is a risk multiplier, but that water is actually a solution uh, multiplier. John, I do hope I got that right. Without further ado, 
I'd like to first invite uh, uh, Ms. Chaudhry from Awareness 360 Founder, because I know she has to leave us uh, uh, very soon. And uh, it's really, yes, uh, the same questions that we have been um, uh, uh, having through these various uh, panels. To first indicate, you know, what are the fundamental changes you consider necessary for accelerating progress to achieve the SDG targets relevant for water for cooperation? How do you consider uh, the, the opportunity of the UN 2023 Water Conference, and in particular the Water Action Agenda, the best leverage to enable the needed action and changes? And of course, to let us know what it is you are going to do within your constituency to see that these commitments actually become a reality. So without further ado, Ms. Chaudhry, over to you. Thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Um, yes. Good morning, everyone. It is truly an honor to be here. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Shomi Hassan Chaudhry, and I'm a water sanitation and hygiene activist from Bangladesh. I'm the co-founder of Awareness 360, which is a global youth-led nonprofit that empowers young people in over 40 countries to act for sustainable development, particularly in clean water and sanitation. I guess in this room, we all know the importance of water and sanitation and how they're linked to our lives in a multitude of ways. But I learned it the hard way. And here's my story. In 2014, almost nine years ago, I lost my mother to diarrhea. And after losing my mother to such a preventable disease in the matter of a day, I was shocked and devastated. When I dived deeper into that issue, I found out how WASH can play a critical role in saving lives and I decided to take action. I conducted my first WASH campaign in a sewerage workers community four days after my mother's passing. And that day I realized the incredible power of storytelling. And since then I continued my WASH activism and through my organization Awareness 360, we have directly benefited over a million people in raising greater awareness and access to WASH among marginalized communities, such as the sex workers, under-resourced school children, people with disabilities, refugees, and many more. And while working in the space as a young person, I have recognized a number of issues which align with today's theme of water for cooperation. We need a holistic and cross-sectoral approach to achieve SDG 6. Oftentimes, I notice that we focus more on water but less on sanitation and hygiene, whereas one complements the other. We focus more on the hardware of things, such as the number of toilets, but less on the software, such as awareness that translates to behavioral change. The beneficiaries of the space are too donor reliant, whereas we need to engage them in the solution designing process and empower them to look after their own needs. And that is also where we can fill the gap of young people's participation. We can build their capacity as enablers of change, invest in their innovative ideas and amplify that our messages are there at the decision-making tables. With the rate at which we are progressing, technology can be our savior from failing to achieve our goals. We also cannot use the same seemingly appropriate solution to different communities with the same or similar need. Hence, it is ideal to engage with the target communities and make our solutions context and culture proof. We need other sectors to come forward upon realizing how interconnected all these issues are. So it's high time that we comprehend the true value of water. Water is a health issue, water is a gender issue, it is a climate issue, a justice issue, and much more. So we need to generate political will and awareness on solving water issues, both in the global north and global south. And another thing that I think is um, very important is that um, we need to focus on uh, young investing in, in young people, because I feel like we have, we, we have, we have taken the approach of to using them as a token. And um, as I said, that it is important that we, we invest in them so that the young people in all of those beneficiary communities um, can, can come forward and, and be a part of the solutions that we are presenting. I'm sorry, I think there's a tech, um, I can't, can you still hear me? Yes, uh, show me, go ahead. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so um, as I was saying that I think that it's important to generate a political will and awareness, we need to invest in young people in their capacity building um, and also understand that how interconnected all these sectors are. Um, I was at COP27 in Egypt um, championing for the elimination of the neglected tropical diseases, the NTDs, which is heavily linked to climate action in several dimensions. For example, vectors, 
um, climate change will increase the spread of neglected tropical diseases as they're directly influenced by changes in temperature, rainfall, uh, relative humidity, and climate. And a second dimension is the impact of climate change on safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene wash. Extreme weather and uh, events such as floods and hurricanes can negatively affect WASH, which is a critical tool for the prevention and management of NTDs. Sanitation plays a key role in preventing exposure to different diseases um, like the NTDs, while safe water and hygienic conditions in health facilities and in homes are essential for the management and care of many NTDs. We also have been talking a lot about implementation, particularly in the, in the last uh, theme, uh, we have heard other speakers mention this. And for that, I think we need better uh, monitoring, evaluation, data collection and analysis, accountability, and most importantly, transparency. Many aspects of sustainable development, such as health, um, food security, and poverty reduction depend on the availability of clean water in sufficient quantity and quality. And although addressing the world's water demands in a sustainable manner presents many obstacles, they're not impossible. The integration of water and sanitation into the policies and plans of certain sectors, as well as the implementation of integrated water resources management at all levels, including the transboundary level, are of utmost importance. Last December, during the UN Water Groundwater Summit in Paris, the Transboundary Water Cooperation Coalition was launched, joined by over 30 governments and organizations, which I think is a significant step forward. This will hopefully lead to a heightened cohesion among the transboundary community. We need to realize the key benefits of managing shared waters, such as faster economic growth, um, greater environmental sustainability, and improved human well-being. And I'm sure this conversation will feed into the UN Water Conference in March, but what I'd like to emphasize more on is the follow-up on, the, on these commitments made. And that brings me to the Water Action Agenda, which is an excellent way forward in collating different commitments from anyone from any sector. And this unified approach will give us a, a clear picture of the avenues that there are for meaningful collaborations. I and my team at Awareness 360 are committing to empower more young people on board with skills, knowledge, mentorship, and motivation to be WASH champions. We would require expert trainers, investors, governments, businesses, and strategic partners to actualize this commitment at a grand scale. The UN Water Conference later this year will present us a great and unique opportunity to not only discuss on key issues, shedding a spotlight on water, but also identify different stakeholders from multiple disciplines with whom we can bring radical transformations for accelerated progress on the global agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shomi. Um, and thank you for sharing your personal experience and your story with us. I would have gladly given up my uh, speaking post yesterday to have you talk as well at the water and health uh, panel uh, for you speak from experience, from pain, and from seeing this firsthand. We congratulate you and commend you for taking action, uh, for mobilizing the youth, for continuing this work, for raising awareness. Um, and um, yes, you're right, uh, in terms of the youth being used uh, uh, mostly to rubber stamp some of our initiatives, but uh, it's great to hear that a lot more is being done and a call to action in terms of the meaningful engagement of uh, the youth. Uh, love your uh, call to action as well, that. Uh, heightened cohesion, uh, unified uh, approach, uh, especially in terms of uh, integrated water resources management and how all that uh, uh, touches the various areas. I know you have to rush, Shomi, Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much for sharing your, your, your experience uh, with us. And we will be looking forward to seeing you and hearing more of you uh, in March 2023. Thank you, Shomi. Thank you, Sarin. Appreciate it. Um, I would like now to uh, introduce uh, Madame Tanya, Ms. Tanya Martinez, the representative of the Indigenous Informal Reference Group on Indigenous Peoples and Water Issues. Uh, Ms. Martinez, over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. My contribution will build on some of the elements of the declaration that we made in the second water process during the Water and Indigenous Peoples Forum. I will post the link later in case you want to check it out. So we all acknowledge that water is a common good and therefore we should be committed to valuing it. I heard that yesterday in several of the sessions, but that we should think of water and not only the tangible material, the commodity values that we usually see on them, we should also think of other re relational values. And that's why I'm linking this to indigenous peoples. When we talk about values, um, 
we see that the system is a holistic one. We don't separate nature, water, territorial management from life. For example, for the Zapotecan indigenous peoples in Oaxaca, they say that the water is sacred and it's a snake that they praise that lives in a river and the river is the source of life. If we want to keep life, if we want to keep the river for food, for the water needs that we have, for the health, healthy health of the ecosystem, we must preserve the forest. So you see there's a holistic management into that. And we also say like this conference, we've been talking about cooperation and how we should ensure inclusive and participation of people, of indigenous peoples who for centuries have been already committed to taking care of water, land, nature, and the life in this planet. So I wanna take you now to the other side of the world, to New Zealand with the Kaipara Moana Remediation Project, which is the, larger, the largest harbor program in, in that country. This country started with the Kaipara Uri indigenous people several years ago when they realized, not because of the practices, but because of several processes happening there, a, a lot of uh, issues linked to water and the ecosystem. So they aim it to reduce erosion, water pollution, and environmental degradation, and they continue to have action, but engage other actors, such as farmers, to later on engage much more and much more actors that finally, in 2020, the New Zealand government uh, signed an agreement for a 10-year program, management program with them. So if we talk about commitments and how we should reinforce cooperation, there are many practices that are already there and that we could learn from. Indigenous peoples with their time-tested science over centuries are ready to take this forward, but we need to support them in that process. So, I would say, what is that we need then? This water action decade, it's an excellent opportunity for a meaningful participation. We need to learn from indigenous peoples. We need to a, scale up many of the innovations and practices, but how can we do that? Let me just take you to some numbers too. When we had the first round of the accreditations, less than the 1% of indigenous peoples that, or, or all the people that was registered was indigenous peoples. In the second accreditation process, the numbers move up to 2%. And I'm pretty sure that other sectors that we say, if you want to make this process inclusive, must be at the table. If you wanna have a voice, if you wanna influence policy, you must be at the table. So this, the concept note of this theme says that we need to promote intercultural participation. We need to include other sorts of knowledge. We need to include other types of actors. And this is a great opportunity for that. Let me take you to another number. Yesterday, also people pointed out the need for funding. If we think of the climate action agenda, a study reveals that from 2011 to 2020, only 1% of the funding that went to climate action was going directly to NGOs managers for indigenous people. So if we want to have action, we also should ensure that financial mechanisms are put in place to support people that has been committed already or that is committed already uh, for many of the actions so they can continue doing what they are doing. Okay, so finally, what are our commitments, the commitments of indigenous peoples? Well, indigenous peoples, as I highlighted before, have been committed for centuries already uh, to sustainability, to take care of water, nature and life that that's what makes us makes indigenous peoples the keepers of 80 percent of the remaining of the world by bio, world's biodiversity in less than 28 percent of the world's surface they practices knowledge has allowed them to live in a broad range of environments practices and commitments in lands in the arid lands of chad in the humid rainforest of the Amazonas or the cold lands of the Arctic. The practices and knowledge make them experts in this area. So we will continue our advocacy work. We want to continue learning from people. We want to have more projects like in New Zealand where several types of knowledge can converge, where several ty types of actors can come together, where people it's willing to learn and support indigenous peoples. We will continue our advocacy work as an informal group. We will continue increasing the power of our partnerships. We will continue inviting people 
to fund and support indigenous peoples with their practices. And this is what I would say. We need to continue learning, documenting of what are many of these practices that indigenous peoples have in their territories and scale them up so we can achieve the targets of this water action decade. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. I don't think it could have been said yes more clearly. We had the pleasure of meeting the indigenous people, uh, the First Nations, I remember in Stockholm last year, and yes, this message was loud and strong. Uh, they are the keepers of the biodiversity. There is knowledge there that is thousands and thousands of years old, uh, knowledge that needs to be brought uh, uh, to be given a lot more visibility that needs to be scaled up. You're right. Sometimes it's not just big tech. Sometimes it's just this knowledge that rests uh, amongst uh, the people. Um, the holistic and also spiritual approach, I believe, that the, the indigenous people bring uh, to the table. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tanya, for this uh, um, for this intervention. And uh, we, I think, everybody is looking forward to really engaging. Uh, with the, the indigenous people, but also in terms of uh, increasing voice as well of uh, uh, this knowledge uh, that remains uh, uh, amongst very old nations. Thank you, uh, Tanya. Um, next, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Councillor Niki Wenam, uh, Executive Mayor of the uh, Dr. Kenneth Gounder District Municipality, Northwest Province, South Africa. Councillor Nam, over to you. Is she? Um, ah, hello. Okay. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, you are, Councillor Nam. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, Program Director, our co hosts, uh, the UN DISA, the Netherlands, and the Pakistan, distinguished guests, fellow speakers, panelists like myself. Let me say um, Happy New Year to all of us. New be beginnings, an opportunity for our countries, our people our communities uh, to start to work together. Um, I have not shared the presentation earlier. I had notes, but I had an opportunity to make a presentation as we were, uh, we were sitting here. I will share that presentation. Um, local, I speak on behalf of SALGA. SALGA is the South African Local Government Association, which is the primary and the most prominent voice on behalf of all of the local municipalities and municipalities in South Africa. Now, as a single center for service delivery, authorities, local government uh, authorities, are centers of, 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 of service delivery. Uh, this is where implementation take place. This is uh, the closest fear to the communities and the people. And it becomes very important, uh, whatever that does happen, it must be meaningful action towards the people. Now we've got three spheres of government. The national government regulates policy maker, and this is where uh, 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 financing uh, is uh, distributed at a national level. Um, at a provincial level, they play more of a support role so that they bring high capacities and at a local level, this is where uh, things are happening and this is where issues of water are expected to find expression at all times. Currently with uh, what is facing the world globally and the, the extreme levels of inequality in South Africa, remember of the historic uh, uh, inequality, uh, the segregation in terms of development, even our infrastructure at all levels is based on uh, the segregation policies that existed a long time ago. Much work has been done uh, in the past 25 years, but there's more work that needs to be done because you would not achieve um, the inequalities that happened over decades and decades of years over a 25 year period. So cooperation for us in South Africa is a non-negotiable. Uh, whether we cooperate uh, between government, the provincial government, the local government and the national government or cooperation between ourselves and those that are having the capital or the required resources, ourselves cooperation with um, your communities it is always something that brings people together because there is nothing that we can do, particularly in the provision of basic services like water without the cooperation that we ought to be doing. So there are various stakeholders, there are partners, there are people that are critical. I like the speaker that spoke earlier in the theme that said, 
we ought to empower our people so that they are able not only to be receivers of the services, but also they play a critical role. Now, because of uh, the nature of our country as a scarce, a water scarce country, we are bound through cooperation to transboundary cooperate with other areas. So transboundaries and international water corporations becomes one of the key things. You've got various Southern countries, whether it's Lesotho, whether it's Zimbabwe, Namibia, Ghana, or any other country, we are bound to cooperate uh, in transboundaries, not only in external countries, but that uh, transboundary cooperation happens even between provinces. You will have your biggest province in South Africa, which is Gauteng, that lacks um, uh, water uh, sources. Now you have your Northwest, you have your Mpumalang and Limpopo that brings in the water sources that are able to channel through bulk infrastructure and that needs to be maintained. This is one of the things again, your transboundary infrastructure for it to be maintained and cooperation to continue. You ought to work together uh, with uh, the rest of the, uh, of the other areas. Now we do have a national water resource strategy in the country. That strategy is a framework that says who does what at one point. And I think there are issues that we can raise where we know as a government and as a community, we have not done much. And one of the key issues is creating massive awareness in our people. How do we preserve the environment? How do we preserve water? Uh, how do you become a big player as a community member other than a consumer of the water that you are, you are talking about? So those are some of the things that we have indicated. One of the key issues in cross-sectoral cooperation again, is building functional and effective cross-sectoral cooperation. When we say functional, um, sometimes I think our governments and uh, all of us, we are able to write and agree in paper, but implementation lacks a lot when it comes to ensuring that action happens. So uh, building functional and effective cross-boundary and cross-sectoral cooperation. The sectors that are there, whether it's uh, NGOs, whether it's organized labor, whether it's institutions that provide the services, whether it's uh, nature reserve areas, that sectoral cooperation, everybody must understand what do you do at a particular uh, given point. Our last point in terms of our one-on-one our -on -one issue, we ought to mobilize society. Maintaining our infrastructure socially becomes critical. Uh, uh, trans uh, boundary related issues and the maintenance and the expansion of um, the infrastructure in that field is one of the key issues. But the most fundamental one is our societies and our people being the biggest collaborators as not only consumers of water, but propellers, but mobilizers, and the people that are at the center of the work that we are doing. So I thought I must just indicate the principles because part of what we have not done is to bring along your your youth formations into the picture is to have an aggressive uh, modules that brings in so that it becomes it, it, it starts in the household from the households it's, it goes to the community from the small community it goes to the ward and from the ward so that we preserve we repurpose we utilize and do what is required thank you very much uh, madam uh, program director well, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Nam. I know we there would be so much in terms of adding, but I do have two more panelists. Uh, but yes, we are bound to cooperate. Exactly. We will be brought together whether we like it or not. <laughs> um, I'd like now to invite uh, Mr. Nicolas uh, Vertimer, co-founder and CEO of Waterplan. Uh, Mr. Vertimer, over to you. Thank you so much for inviting us uh, to this amazing panel. I will be super quick. I feel like I represent the technology sector and I feel like I'm in an investor pitch, you know, like I need to go <laughs> fast to respect my other colleagues. So basically uh, I represent Waterplan. I'm one of the co-founders. Basically Waterplan is a software as a service science platform to help companies quantify and mitigate water risk. Basically we're already working with one of the largest Fortune 500 companies on their water stewardship and using technology 
technology uh, to basically help them address their targets. And uh, I believe that I can answer those questions by starting a little bit with my story because I, I know I represent Silicon Valley technology and, and scalability. And I will explain a little bit about that in a second. But actually, like my background is I am a medical doctor. I have seen waterborne diseases myself. I have treated them. And I have decided basically to dedicate my life to water for the past 10 years. Basically, I basically I went like watershed by watershed, community by community, trying to like implement water water acts and sanitation projects. At some point, I realized that my patient was much bigger and it was basically the watershed and basically providing help to that system. And I tried to find like the best ways to achieve that and working uh, together with governments, uh, NGOs and, and corporations, I found that it was the, the best way to achieve that. And But something was lacking, right? So I I, I basically worked around like 300,000 people with now that now have access to water, act, to, to water, to safe drinking water water but I realized that with technology and it's because I enter into these like amazing entrepreneurial groups such as the World Economic Forum Global Shapers that technology people was moving much faster basically and so what I wanted to do is basically to leverage every advance in technology and, and science to basically address this and I believe that the, this opportunity this conference can basically help us align with actually the mission of water plan that it's basically accelerate the transition to a water secure world and we do that in, in modules we use features we listen to our users we try to identify the best use case for them to get to their targets basically and we do that just to like uh, sum up and leave time for my beautiful colleagues here it's like by putting together all the amazing data that is already out there like sat satellite data such as the the great satellite mission collecting local data structuring that data and finding the best way for that data to be used right and continuously update that information continuously monitor that information so basically we can adapt to better impact Back on, and on our actions, right? And we have like specific examples, like for example, with water, uh, with Danone, people said uh, organizations such as Water Equity are already like putting together uh, initiatives such as we think like the collective action and, and investment planning coalition that basically can add a lot of value. And with Water Plan, we are piloting to put together information from the watersheds where some organizations, some companies have supply sites and some other sites like operational sites and cross mapping that information to understand the right risk and the right initiatives and incentives for us to invest and protect the watershed with the financial uh, tools that are there uh, that already exist right so we need to put together that data to make the right decisions and track that impact i'm like the crazy doctor with a technology hat right now and i'm super willing to see how we can accelerate this transition in this amazing conference so thank you so so much for this opportunity Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicola. You've actually been given a moniker, Dr. Water. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Monsieur Nielsen, uh, Global Division Director, Climate Adaptation, Ambol, over to you. Thank you very much, Shireen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, on the chair. And, and thank you, UND, for arranging this. And thanks for all the inspiring talks already from, from my colleague panelists. and. A good question from the participants. So I'm Christian Nielsen. I'm Global Division Director in Ramble for our Division for Water Infrastructure and, and Climate Resilience. So I want to try to provide my few cents on, uh, on how, how we see uh, the opportunities and challenges uh, here as, as uh, you uh, asked in the questions just in the beginning of this. And this is a combination of of our experience from both the developing country and the and developed countries. So, uh, yeah, I've I've also just uh, very humble after you know following after these uh, very inspiring uh, um, talks and Natalie Shomi and her personal experience from Bangladesh, which touched me a lot also from working there myself. So. Um, so um, regarding the fundamental uh, the fundamental changes that we see uh, needed for accelerating the, the progress which we all desperately need. Uh, uh, as we all know, the water does not know the administrative uh, boundaries. This is the biggest challenge, but it is also our biggest opportunity, but it because it puts us right in the center of the urban planning both in Copenhagen, New York City, Kulna, Bangladesh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and throughout the world. Now, all of a sudden, we as the water experts 
we are in the center of the planning and we really need to take this opportunity and take this upon us. This is a huge responsibility uh, and, we, and we need to leverage this together and I know we can do that. Um, so um, just to be very specific on how we uh, uh, intend to commit uh, to this uh, as, as a company through the next uh, couple of years in our strategy period, uh, and I'm very glad that Shomi also mentioned this. We, we see two uh, main focus areas for us. We want to bring the end users and the residents to the table and empower them. These are the ones that will hold the city governments accountable now and in the future. The water action agenda is depending on the cities and they are depending on the end users and the residents. So it's so super important. The other uh, um, segment that we feel we need to bring to the table and will focus on dedicated in this uh, period is the young water professionals. We need to bring them to the table. They are the ones accountable beyond 2030, right? So this is what we really need to focus on. And specifically, we need to work very detailed, both with the financing institutions and with the beneficiaries to make sure that the terms and conditions in the tendering process are changed in a way so we not uh, will favor the retrospective senior expertise only, but also actually the young innovators, because this is what the world needs. This is what we all need to change this and to really accelerate the, the progress here. So this is this is our commitment in terms of how we see the drastic changes in, in the uh, to achieve the uh, the water agenda, water action agenda. So how do we then uh, consider this in terms of, uh, of the, the UN 2023 conference. Obviously, this is our window of opportunity. As Hank already set the scene from the beginning, this is, this is now. And, and we should all come very prepared with very specific targets and commitments to this conference. Uh, and not only the commitments, also with our plan to, to engage the political leadership, because as James mentioned, we, we do have the leadership, we lack a little bit of awareness, and we lack a lot of decision support. So we need to really be sharp coming out together from this conference, because now we have the attention. So I really urge that we all push for this from now on to the uh, conference and beyond. Uh, and last, uh, on, on the commitments uh, that we're preparing uh, for the water action agenda on the scope and the partners that we want to commit, uh, we, we, we as a company will always, of course, uh, work uh, on the broader water action agenda. Uh, however, we, we have we, we wish to bring at least three very specific uh, points to the agenda. We, we need, in our opinion, to work more on the climate justice side of things as a corporate. We want to really commit and we want to be demonstrating that this is the new normal. We all need as corporates to to focus on this and we need to present something that we can scale and all commit to. This is something that I really believe in. Uh, secondly, we, we know it's, 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 it's been said uh, many times, we know a lot of the solutions. We know it's nature-based design that we need, but we need to take this to the next level. We want to commit to that as well, together with the with the universities uh, that we are already engaging in to, to take uh, to develop the next generation of bioengineering and climate positive solutions. This is our commitment. Uh, and last but not least, I've already mentioned that in the beginning, we are committed to engage the young water professionals, both from our company, and we want to see them out working with all of you guys uh, across the globe. This is this is what we all need. So I'm just looking forward to, to meeting you all in New York City in March.
Thank you, ma'am. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for that. Unfortunately, I mean, we could have stayed here all day, uh, but I think that's what New York is going to be for. Uh, we cannot take uh, the questions from the audience, but uh, uh, thank you all for your participation and for your excellent presentations, contributions, personal experiences, and we wish you a fantastic end of the day. Thank you. Over to you, Naiha. Thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Malik, for moderating this panel to the amazing panelists for uh, the great presentations. Again, the PowerPoints, they will all be uploaded online for uh, participants. And we are also combining the questions from the participants and trying to respond to as many as we can through the, the Q&A. And I, I, as uh, Sareen has just said, we really hope this is just yeah, an, a touch uh, so just so you can continue the conversation here in New York, hopefully in with, you know, more pace and that you can go deep uh, on, on the, the discussions. So let's start with our last panel of today. Uh, it, this will be covering the fifth theme of the UN Water Conference, Interactive Dialogue. So Water Action Decade, accelerating the implementations of the objectives of the decade, including through the UN Secretary General's Action Plan. Uh, let me invite Ms. Josefina Mestu. She's independent expert and water advisor to the Secretary of State for Environment of the Ministry of Ecological Transition and the Government of Spain. She will be moderating this panel. Ms. Mestu, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nayara. Thank you, Yuendesa, and the co hosts for organizing this very interesting webinar and very intense. You know, everybody is very committed and very, and very uh, interested in the results of the conference, obviously. Uh, my most uh, warm welcome to this last session of this webinar about the Water Action Decade and how to, implement, to, to accelerate the implementation of the UN Secretary General Action Plan. So let me first of all remind you of the three objectives of the decade, which are advanced sustainable development, energized implementation of existing programs and projects. And these sessions, this webinar is a very good example of the energy that exists behind all the, uh, all the stakeholders and also mobilize action to achieve the 2030 agenda. In the previous sessions, I think we have already heard many proposals for moving forward with these objectives through WOS, water valuing, water cooperation, climate resilience. And we are now here in this session taking a little bit more of a global governance approach. There are many proposals on the table uh, about uh, global governance. Uh, we heard about the Secretary General Special Envoy, about annual conferences in the occasion of the high level political forum the need to formalize the space for member states on water in the UN issues. We heard a lot in these sessions about you know, the role of the stakeholders and what we need to do. And uh, in order to, to tackle the, this, this, this theme today, uh, this last theme, we are privileged to have three exceptional speakers which are here in the, in the slide. We have Mr. Kenzo Hiroki, coordinator of the high level experts and leaders panel on water and disasters help and professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies of Japan. We have uh, Mr. Ochai Umber, professor of practice of the Arizona State University, a member of the Water Policy Group. And Ms. Carolina Tornesi McKinnon, president of the World Youth Parliament for Water. They are going to address the three key questions. One is what needs to change to accelerate the achievement of the decade's objectives? How? the UN conference can help and what commitments they have. So like the other panelists in the other panels, we are addressing the three questions. So first of all, I would like to ask Ms. Carolina Tornesi to address these questions. So Carolina, what needs to change and, and uh, what is uh, the, how the conference can, can help? Let us know what your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josefina, and thank you all for having me here. I'll be very quick. Um, I think what we really need to change is something we all know. We urgently need multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder commitments to actions, not the usual siloed approach. We need to collaborate across the water community and outside of it and follow through with our commitments. The water action agenda needs to be engaging and understandable for member states as well as all other stakeholder groups to ensure that we all can take joint ownership in the future of the water. I think 
Um, the UN 2023 conference and the water action agenda poses a great opportunity um, because it can be used as a space to amplify and showcase projects and programs that are actually working and make positive change. So the water action agenda is a space in which people can see where they can scale up on projects, maybe borrow ideas and apply them in their regions or countries. And also it can be used uh, to share ideas and to have contact points on how to implement these changes that are working. The platform and space is also able to connect various stakeholders. There's no barrier for entry in the water action agenda. And I think that's what makes it so powerful. That means that anybody outside of the water community can come look, can come and try and make other commitments. It can connect to member states to different organizations. It can connect water community to outside of water community um, and hopefully also connect industry members to, to different experts. And that way we can co-create solutions and actions to achieve SDG six. It's called the water action agenda. And so I'm going to say action a lot because that's what we're trying to focus on. This is also an opportunity to do something different by getting these various communities to commit to these game-changing actions and making them public. And making them public is not just to go um, to say that this is the commitment they've made, but it's also a way of asking for help or people that want to join that kind of movement or that commitment. So please use it as like a social platform, if you will, in order to engage, get ideas, and again, follow through on, on these commitments. We all know that a week in New York is not going to change the state of water, uh, but hopefully the week in New York can be this catalyst, this wave of positive energy, something where we're saying this is, this is the start of the end of our water crisis. And as Hank reminded us at the beginning of this call, the water action agenda will only have as much life as we breathe into it. So the commitments are the meat and potatoes. They're, they're really what, what is going to, to make this positive change that we need. It's not just the title water action agenda. And finally, for the third part, what kind of commitment is the World Youth Comment for Water and youth um, in, a, in a wider scope bringing? So there are two points that I wanted to bring up. Hopefully you've heard of 30, 30, 30. If you haven't, um, the idea is we want to, we as young people want to partner with organizations who commit to having 30% of their org or community to be under 30 by 2030. This isn't to say that you need to have your CEOs or the leaders all be people under 30, but what we're trying to say is there's much needed diversification of decision makers of high level and low level organizations. And this is a quick and easy commitment um, that we want to help implement. And so young people are also committing to working together to tackling these water issues, whether it be through governments, NGOs, private companies. Another commitment we're hoping to encourage is a UN Youth Envoy on Water to work hand in hand with the future UN Special Envoy on Water in order to help coordinate actions for youth worldwide and also to ensure that youth voices are adequately represented at the highest levels regarding the monitoring and implementation of the water action agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolina. You know, three minutes, a little more. <laughs> so you really were a hero here. I think uh, you're making a very strong call, you know, for doing things differently. Thank you, Carolina. It makes sense, you know, we are going to move multi-sectoral, that we need to, to have a place or a platform for multi-stakeholder collaboration. So thank you for that. And something that I like to, to point to, to that is that uh, it's really not about some general collaboration. It is collaboration in projects, in a specific tasks. I love that very much because we are talking about action on the ground. And I think it's very important that we just don't make a general call, but also, you know, that we make a call for specific actions. And I hope people have listened already about your proposal and your offer for this 30-30-30 initiative and, and that you get a lot of people, you know, committed and, and, and helpful with, with your initiative itself. So thank you, Carolina. I would like now to, to move on to, to Mr. Olchai Umber. Uh, Olchai, what, what, is, what, is, what do you think needs to, to change? And, and mainly, you know, what do you think, uh, 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 how the conference can help? You know, you've been in this business for a long time. You are one of the key international actors, so you, you have a lot of experience. What can you share with us? Thank you, Olka. Thank you, thank you, Josefina. Um, as you said, I, I will focus on the governance aspects 
uh, that can be game changers. And uh, being uh, remembering that this is the last part of the, the very last webinar before the conference, I'll be action oriented and brief. I, I think um, in referring to the water action decade, uh, the Secretary General uh, identified uh, two points very well. Uh, he said water is critical to tackling the triple environmental crisis of climate, biodiversity, and pollution and to achieving sustainable development. And he also said that the international community has through milestone events created momentum which needs to be turned into action. So he, he brought everything to, to July when he reported on the action decade. So building on that and what happened after that in the food, uh, in the climate summit, uh, biodiversity summit, etc. I will um, try to, uh, to, to list five actions uh, that could be game changers, uh, particularly with respect to the, the water conference uh, this March, but in general also. Number one is member states of the United Nations reflect what they have already manifested in these milestone United Nations platforms into actionable voluntary commitments through the water action agenda. Number two, member states individually as well as in groups make use of the conference as a platform to declare to the world pledges that they will incorporate water concretely in their actions for climate change, for food security, to tackle biodiversity loss, to, to eliminate land degradation and drought, and for sustainable development, and they pledge that they will monitor and report on it. Number three, member states making use of and building on the commitment of the UN General Assembly and its president, uh, use the UN 2023 Water Conference and call upon the General Assembly to authorize that all sectoral conferences of the United Nations include in their agendas an item about how improved water outcomes can contribute to their sectoral objectives and also how they can contribute to improved water outcomes. Number four, the financial community, development banks and development partners not only boost their water portfolios, but establish water quotas in their other portfolios, breaking the silos and urging for water to concretely emerge in proposals. Number five, the UN system and member states in partnership with scientific community and business sector take action to break the barriers that have so far not allowed for science and technology to help innovate towards the transformative change that is needed. Most of these five, if not all, of the above would also qualify as tangible, worthy entries in the voter action agenda. And this would be my first intervention, Josefina. Thank you, Olshai. Very interesting. You are making a, a very strong call to member states. You know, in the previous, in the previous presentation, it was a call to stakeholders. And now we are making a very strong call to member states to, to have the responsibilities for including water in national plans, for including water in the UN conferences, no? for having this water quota in the financing instruments for, for sectoral investments. So, so you're, bringing, you're bringing this idea again very strongly, like the previous speaker, of, of this multi-sectoral approach that is needed, you know? And, and I'm hearing loud and clear the other side of the coin, Olchai, that uh, maybe we are protecting our boundaries and our silos too much, and we need to change that. So I think, thank you very much. And although it seems obvious to everybody, it is not so obvious in practice, you know, in the normal practice. So thank you very much for that. I would like now to, to, to give the floor to Mr. Kenzo Hiroki. Kenzo, I know it's very late for you, but please, you know, the floor of yours. I'm sure that we will gain a lot from your experience. Thank you very much, Josefina. What I want to see through the water decade, including this UN conference, is the uh, water data and information transformation. 
That is the foundation of the better government, governance domestically or internationally. We are now discussing that you know, we have to quadruple the pace of the access for water, sanitation, and hygiene for just to say about SDG 6.1 and 6.2. Uh, and the decades objective of the decade is much broader than that. Then obviously we need more money from outside conventional water sector. But you know, our water information is too much in a water information silo. For the investors and bankers, water is too far to even think about it. The, you know, but you know, if they are not aware that they are, what they are investing is associated with the water risks, what happens to the water pollution uh, in the area of the industry, what happens to the environment, what you know, disaster risk their industrial area will have. So although investors and bankers are very close to the water risks and opportunities, they are just not aware, Be partially because the water sector has not made water information data easily available for the use. And, you know, that is the first thing to do. To do. And for the info, you know, uh, transformation and the revolutionizing water sector itself, we need water data information transformation. For example, we have uh, thousands, and, uh, thousands and millions of the uh, water infrastructure on us. And they have built on the very much modern technologies, but operated by the water information of the past century. Hmm. By doing so, they are wasting trillions of water almost every day, every year. For example, if you talk about the existing dam, they are, they are just you know, or using water not knowing that there'll be a very dry season next year. And they are storing too much water, not knowing that you know, the peak flood is coming next month. But these days, because of the you know, uh, revolutionizing, revolutionizing uh, uh, climate and water information uh, system, the prediction of water is much, much easier and more accurate. If you invest in the existing dam by transforming, uh, transforming, transforming the uh, water hydrological data uh, and analysis, then you can create a billions of cash by, uh, ma by making the operation more effective. For example, if you know that a large flood is coming next week, then you can just empty the dam and store water for the flood. By doing so, you can just you know or mitigate it, the damage in the in a week. Okay. So these things have to happen through the decade. This cannot happen just by one conference, but yeah. we have luckily uh, most six seven years at the end of, by the end of the uh, water decade. Okay. Uh, so, okay. For... And so how the conference can help? Because I can hear very clearly that, that the challenge is the data and information that we are working with silos and we are working with all information that is not good enough. But, you know, what can the UN conference do for us in that, in that sense? The UN conference can help by making a water agenda with a, an apart, one of the focus should be on the water data and the information transformation. Uh, already there are some commitments uh, built, built, uh, being built up in that uh, direction. So many countries and institutions are trying to make a sizable commitment to mm -hmm. enable digital transformation for water. And uh, the UN conference can be a, a galvanizer for uh, such a new actions. But for the water decade after that, the water decade can be an incubator of those ideas and commitments of the UN conference. So these two, conference and decade, should go in tandem. Luckily, 
the uh, UN decade has already a continuous process of following up, like a Dushanbe process. That will be a uh, good opportunities to follow up constantly uh, the commitment and actions by the UN conference. UN conference is just a gigantic uh, conference for water sector, but it is still one of the major conferences for those outside water box. Yeah. The important thing is that UN conference through the connection with the uh, uh, related uh, conference like a climate change conference and Sendai Polar process. This can be positioned as a milestone, not only for water, but also for other sectors in, across the uh, SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kensa. So now, now I'm going to go for the last uh, question, no, Olchai. What are your commitments? You know, what, what the, not, not only uh, what uh, uh, the conference can do for us, but what can we do for the, making the conference and the, and the objectives of the, of the decade a success? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, we, as the Water Policy Group, we put forward three game changers at the stakeholder consultation of the president of the UN General Assembly in October last year. The first one is called listening to national water leaders through a survey aligned with the teams of the 2023 Water Conference and the SDG6 accelerators. The survey is already underway, uh, more than halfway through, disseminated through the office of the president of the General Assembly. And we will be unveiling the findings at the 2023 conference. Number two is mainstreaming water into sectoral United Nations conferences. This is a game changer and we have been advocating for this and we are hoping that the, the 2023 conference will be a turning point for that. And I have already said that a couple minutes ago. Uh, number three is a policy scaffolding mechanism for governments to have access to a comprehensive set of basic policy principles and strategies based on successful experiences globally. Provided by the multilateral system, this could make it easier for ministers to advocate necessary water reform within their governmental processes and help jumpstart the necessary reform work. Uh, this proposal received support at the preparatory session in October at the General Assembly and we hope that it will gain further momentum for materialization at the conference and we will um, we will continue our advocacy and um, and support efforts thank you thank you all chai Sandra, we are accumulating interesting proposals you know in the, in this session we heard about the 30 30 30 initiative this idea of the policy uh, scaffolding, Olcha, I think is, is is fantastic. I mean, we can really find a way to to for governments to self reflect and and also address policy reform. That would be something. It's a game change, changer certainly. So, Kenzo, what about you? What are the commitments that you are making? Uh, uh, my personal commitment is to carry the messages and actions uh, from the UN to other international actors. For example, they are like G20, G7 they are other leaders and then they have their different role to advocate and to take a lead in water actions. So the important thing is how those leaders, President and Prime Minister see our water conference and how they see that our actions are connected to their actions. That is what I'm committed to do. The second thing is not, uh, it's not um, only my commitment for, but also should be the everybody's commitment is to connect climate change adaptation and mitigation. We are too much separated about the discussion because we are just talking about air. If you talk about air, adaptation and mitigation is totally separated. But if you talk about water, it is inseparable. As I said, you know, the water adaptation measures as a field is also water mitigation measures. In case of, for example, if you improve the dam operation, you can reduce the uh, you know emission of the carbon dioxide e easily. So we have to talk, you know, together with everybody, that uh, you know, climate change adaptation and mitigation is one, not a separate issue. Thank you, Kenzo. Thank you, Kenzo. Thank you, Olcha. 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 Thank you, Olcha
that is my commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all of you, to Carolina, to all Chai, to, to Kenzo. Um, I don't see any questions. I think probably we are late and people are tired. Uh, I only see one, one sort of suggestion uh, for the government of Spain, and I will address that uh, separately here about uh, pollution by plastic, and I will do so. I will provide some contacts to the person who, who, who asked for it. But otherwise, you know, unless there is any more questions from the audience, I, I suggest that uh, there is a lot of food for thought. And uh, as you see, this, this session, this last session has been very dynamic. And I think uh, the speakers have been very much to the point. So I, I would like, I would like to, to thank you, my, the speakers and also the organizers for this very interesting discussion and proposals. And I hand it back to Nayara Costa, unless there are more questions on the, on the Google Doc, but I don't see it. So thank you very much, Nayara. Thank you so very much, Ms. Master, for uh, managing this last session and to the panelists and a uh, huge thanks to all the participants who joined us for two days and stayed with us a little longer than expected. Um, as, as the others have said, this is just the beginning of the conversation and we will uh, be seeing you around. We hope to see many of you around here in New York for the conference itself. So thank you again for joining us. And as I mentioned before, all the updates about the conference, they will be published on the web page, uh, the, the conference website. I really encourage you to keep checking the website. Whenever information is available, it goes up to the website. Several things are also being discussed, adjusted, um, and information is made public as soon as it's, uh, it's agreed and defined. And as you may uh, uh, estimate, organizing such a huge endeavor, a historical endeavor demands a lot of effort from everyone. And we are really grateful to count with this amazing and energetic community uh, working with us. So. Let me take this opportunity before I close. I really need to express our gratitude to the co-hosts of the conference. Um, and let me just uh, give the names of some colleagues that work very close with, with us. So Irma, Robert, Yulia from the Netherlands, and also Rustan from Tajikistan. They are our uh, key partners in working together for support to stakeholder engagement processes and also for this webinar. And then on the desk, uh, I want to express my thank you to our UN Water colleagues that have been great also supporting in several fronts, uh, even last minute requests. And to my DESA colleagues, Jasmine, Lineke, Yunxiao, Giorgetti, and, and Romy for uh, all the great work uh, behind the scenes. So thank you again to everyone. And we hope to see you at the uh, UN 2023 Water Conference in March. This event is now concluded. Thank you. <laughs>